Welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast, where we talk about finding the why and how people buy. I'm your host, Victor Antonio. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for lending me your ears. Today, I have the one and only Jamie Shanks. Now, I met Jamie at the 10X Growth Cod. I think it was year two. Jamie Shanks, welcome to the Sales Influence Podcast. Fantastic, Victor. Thank you for having me. Matt, so, hey, by the way, how did you like wind up getting to know Grant Cardone and attending that event. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, he, he often says and talks about finding mentors, finding people you want to be, you want to you know, gravitate around those that can teach. This was not one of those moments. So I've intentionally joined EO and a Collective 54 and other you know entrepreneurial groups. But the way this started is Jared on his team uh, had been looking at enhancing the curriculum within Cardone University. He loved the posts that we would make and the, you know, the hot emerging topic at that time that was social selling, wanted to talk about it. And we would do these phone calls together. And then one day I said, Jared, we've been talking on the phone. I'm in Miami at a keynote for a customer. Can I drop by the office? And I happened to be in this hot pink blazer. It's Miami. You had to look good. <laughs> and he said, well, hold on. I think, by the way, I, I think I've seen yeah. that blazer, by the way. And they showed me around their old Cardone office. And Grant was in his green room filming an episode. They dragged mm -hmm. me into the green room. And I became, you know, this 20-minute segment within, the, you know, within this Grant University podcast and uh, left with Grant saying, would you want to be part of this thing called 10X? And uh, we'll talk offline about it. And that's where that ball began. And I came back to Miami, met you at the 10X. Yeah, it was funny. I, Jared, uh, big shout out to Jared Glant over there with Grant Cardone Technologies. I think it's the official yeah. name, but with Grant Cardone. Uh, but same thing, uh, Jared uh, had reached out to me because uh, I do more a B2B. That's my thing, the B2B side. And it says, Victor, I've heard you speak, you know, and I just finished doing my television show, Life or Debt on Spike. And so he says, come on over doing this. I mean, I didn't know what it was. I got to be honest, James. I said, sure, man, I'll do it. You know, and I just flew down and I met everybody. It was it was a great event, by the way. And I, it's amazing. What did you take away from that I've event? I still follow some of the people that were on stage as my Instagram inspiration, you know, almost like my mentors mm -hmm. from afar. Uh, that I mm -hmm. saw at that event, and I, I was blown away by the talent. And subsequently, I mean, you've seen the talent. Basketball and movie stars are at the, you know, the, the new ones. Oh, it's scaling yeah. up. It's they scaling don't invite up, me. Man. I, think I don't have... get invited anymore. <laughs> no, neither do I. Neither do I. Uh, Floyd Mayweather, I think, was one of the last guests they had. I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I think they also... Who's the guy that married Je Jennifer Lopez? Oh, oh uh, uh, a Alex, yeah, Alex Rodriguez was out there also. So yeah, but they're doing great things on the real estate side. I mean, I think it's probably taken off. So it seems like they're doing well. But let's get back to you. So I want to talk about when I first met you, you were talking and I think at that time you were talking about social selling. And this concept of sales for life was either being started or at least in my mind, it was it was just taking off. Talk to me about how you got into the sales business. Talk to me about that. And then let's talk about sales sure. for life. So the journey was, uh, and it depends on how far you want to go back, but I never wanted to be a seller. I actually wanted to be a stockbroker. So grade nine, my volunteer days was working at, uh, it was called Bank of Montreal. And I would volunteer. I'd look at the bond ticket desk. I would sit there. And I was so interested. I don't know, suspenders. I, I wanted to be a stockbroker. I volunteered all throughout university two to three days a week at a stock brokerage. And then eventually they hired me and I finished my university and worked full time together. And then 2000 happened, the crash of 2000. And I saw what I thought everybody, remember when I became a, a you know, a licensed uh, investment rep, you know, the young in investment rep, everybody was making money. This is 97, 98, 99, then 2000 happens. And I watched the ugly side and I saw what brokers were doing. And I realized brokers weren't actually stock pickers, they were salespeople. And I then said, I'm not going to be one of those. I moved to Australia. I did my master's degree there, lived there for a couple of years. And when I came back, it turns out 
that no one will hire any a guy with a master's degree from Australia who only has sales experience. The only jobs I could get was a sales job. And I started in commercial real estate, 100% commission, and I fell in love with sales. And that turned me, I went to a software company, became a VP of sales, and we took it from infancy to 3 million ARR. Uh, it helped it uh, become cash flow positive. And I decided around the age of 30 that I would spin out my own little consultancy and help local Toronto companies with inside sales. So that's about as ambitious a plan as I had at that time. And I failed for the first couple of years. I was a, uh, a master of none or whatever that saying is, right? I just, I would do anything for a dollar. And it wasn't. Sure. And by the way, that's. But by, by the way, that's being. Yeah, honest, it's just, I love that was. because we. I had you got to piece things together sometimes. Hodgepodge yeah. of services, and I stumbled upon. There's a whole backstory, and you know, for another podcast, I stumbled upon this idea that you could use a tool like LinkedIn, and reverse engineer that tool to be leveraged like it was the phone, email. It had a left brain and a right brain component to it. It had research and intelligence built in, and it had an engagement platform built right into it. Yet there were no courses on LinkedIn for sales. There was no, the word social selling hadn't been invented. And so this is 2012. I helped pioneer a category called social selling. And we would use tools like LinkedIn and Twitter as a business development tool. And eventually that spanned into helping customer success, retain, upsell, cross sell their customers. And the business started humbly and went to a multi-million dollar business. By the time I had met you, it was already a, a multi-million dollar business. Um, and our customers, we've concentrated primarily on the global enterprise and the global mid market. So the ability to scale learning uh, across an organization. And yeah, that's how it all began. And um, I didn't plan it. It kind of f fell in my lap. And by the way, that's, that's a true entrepreneur story. So out of curiosity, so, you know, when you were doing the hodgepodge, putting it all together, the concept of social selling via LinkedIn, you know, vis-a-vis -vis LinkedIn came to mind. What did you do differently? I mean, was it, was it that the right product at the right time that, you know, allowed your business to grow or what did you do? What, what happened that you were able to scale it, but you weren't able to do it that It was before? a singular idea that manifested itself into a process and framework. And let me explain what that is. If you've ever seen the movie Back to the Future, you remember Doc Brown smacked his head off a toilet and he invented the flux capacitor. And he had this like grand <laughs> vision. I had a very similar event. And what I had created was a concept called the sphere of influence. And all that it was, hmm. was a company would take a sheet of paper and in the center of a sheet of paper would draw a customer, an active, happy advocate customer and draw a circle around it and, and with spider webs kind of coming off of it and asking themselves a fundamental question, who cares about the story of my customer? And when you, when you kind of back up from that fundamental question, you realize that as an example, there are advocates, C-level executives that have up and left that company and gone on to be C-level executives somewhere else. There are companies that recruit talent from that company and you can actually mine that data to figure out who they are. I can actually then also dive into the advocates themselves at my customer and figure out their relationships using LinkedIn as a referral source. So that one, comp that one customer could span me five to 10 prospects that would care about the relationship of that story. And that sphere of influence was the singular idea that eventually grew that into a framework and a methodology called social selling mastery. Uh, then eventually it became digital sales mastery. And that's how it all started. Um, so my product mm -hmm. was was transferring knowledge to people. Um, and mm -hmm. it started with PowerPoint presentations. And then eventually uh, uh, we licensed learning management platforms and then eventually built our own learning management platform. Uh, that is now in 10 languages and it, you know, scaled globally. Uh, but uh, it started with one simple, you know, sheet of paper. I love that. The, the, the flux, I love the flux capacitor analogy. I love that, man. I love it. And, but it, it's interesting how that simple idea, 
which today I think we kind of take for granted now. Do you know what I mean? We, we take that for granted, but probably, as you say, back in 2000, I think 11 or 12, you said, uh, was probably something very novel and very different for a lot of companies. What do you see? Now, let's fast forward to today. Let's, let's go back to the present. Let's come back to the present. And so could you have pulled it off now? Let's say you had, you had the same idea right now. Would it be different? Would it be as effective? What do you think? Um, I, I had one thing going for me. That was mm. first mover advantage. The only reason that I uh, cate- or created the category and category control of the word social selling was it didn't exist. And so what had happened was I was on my laptop company was making no re- my, my little consultancy is making no revenue. I have barely any customers. And I would stare at my laptop trying to figure out how do I prospect for myself? And using that sphere of influence concept, I started using LinkedIn and reverse engineering it and finding these back doors and these hacks. But then I would also turn to Google and say, who can help me with that didn't exist? There were no courseware at that time. There were People didn't realize you could use a tool like LinkedIn for the left and the right brain, research intelligence and engagement. And so now, you know, fast forward almost 10 years later, now it's unbelievable the um, the small percentage of companies that have become digitally enabled and, and are strong social sellers. That uh, I actually expected that within a few years, there'd be 20 competitors all over our back. And you no, know, it turns out that we were in a niche of a niche and uh, there were very few that jumped into the space. And actually we had um, an investor in the business and she would talk about the uh, the concept happened in marketing automation. So she was part of Eloqua back in 2000 when it started. And she would say, you know, a couple of years in, it was five or six or seven years in, and they couldn't believe at that time how little traction marketing automation by the year 2006, 2007 had actually happened. And it's just, it takes that long to adopt. And now fast forward to the year 2021, you take it for granted, but uh, so to answer your question, uh, can it, could it work now? Of course, you're just jumping into a red ocean rather than a blue ocean. Correct. Mm. I love, I love that by the way, I, 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 that the first move principle is always there. And I, the thing is you have to be able to see it. And unless you have that moment, the flux capacitor moment, uh, these are things you can't see. So when you look at the market today, I, I was reading, um, uh, well, rather, I was on a podcast and the guy mentioned a book called Hook Point. And I wanted to get your thoughts on this because you, you, you seem to have the reflective retrospect on how things have changed. He said something about, and I don't have the numbers right, but I'll give you the, the scale of the numbers are right. He said back in 2007, there was like maybe like he said, like 6,000 to 8,000 content creators online. He said today the number's like three point, I don't know, three point something billion, he said. And I just wanted to get your thoughts on that, because when he said that, I was like, what? Because I've never really thought about it, but things have changed because there's so much noise out there now. What, what's your take on this when it comes to marketing, especially? Well, oh, and um, from a marketing channel, if you are not creating a community on something that is very point, not even just point solution, but very hyper focused, and it's not focused on amassing some community of a million generalist, inter- generally interested people. You want 200 or 500 raving advocates who can't get enough of that topic. In, in today's day and age, I think could be more powerful. There, there is everyone, if you have a nut and bolt company, you're making content now. And so Mm -hmm. everyone is making (laughs) like the the act of producing content is no longer the competitive advantage. Correct. Uh, And also because intellectual property content being pieces of intellectual property is free to consume anywhere on the Internet. So you have to have an opinion and a voice that is taking it from kind of superficial topics down into the depths of, uh, you know, of a trench. And really, really uh, diving into a topic in a way that others aren't. And so there'll be a portion of a market that will gravitate to you because they'll say, no, he's gone beyond, he or she's gone beyond, you know, the why change. He or she's now diving into the how 
and the, mm-hmm. the the pitfalls, the challenges, the best practices. That's where I think uh, content is most valuable and served. And um, I've become less concerned about the size of our database. I used to be. Mm -hmm. size of my database, the size of my LinkedIn connections. Look at, Mm -hmm. you know, it's almost like my cred score on social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. None of that. (laughs) Like it just because in today's day and age, a hundred raving advocates can do more for my business than a hundred thousand generalists who whiff, you know, if you look at your website traffic and it's like, oh, the bounce rate is every 13 seconds. You're like, well, what good is that? Right, right. I, by the way, I love what you're saying because you don't hear this a lot, Jamie. Uh, several things you said, uh, just to highlight. I think we've gone into hyper-specialization. I think it's what you're saying when you go into a niche market. And then with that hyper-specialization, it's going to serve, uh, as Seth Golden would call it, I guess, a tribe or your, what's the other one, a cohort, whatever that word is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And well, because you, you, you guys, that? you Americans call, uh, I'm Canadian, if anybody's listening, you <laughs> Americans call it, there's riches in the niches. <clears throat> now, we yeah, pronounce yeah. it niche, so it doesn't rhyme. Right. But it is so true that mm. building something hyper-specialized, even, you know, for a specific market, is, a, is that fantastic differentiator rather than a, being a generalist. Like, trying, if you were in a space right now, trying to be yet another sales consultant, could, could, like, there's a gazillion of us. So there's too I, many. There's I, yeah, too I, many. I honestly. So <laughs> if you don't have a very unique offering, like ten times right. better than anybody else, I just don't know how you compete. It's very tough. I, you know, I've I've launched many a sales training career. I can't tell you how many people have like consumed my material. Says you motivated me to start my business in selling. I'm like, oh, great, thank you. I don't know how I feel about that. I'm conflicted right there. It but, is but, amazing uh, over the years how many end up bouncing back. And I've noticed, and now doing this nearly 10 years, they'll, they'll do a dabble and then they'll go back. Mm, yeah, a lot of people tend to go back. You know, the, the you mentioned something about, there was hyper-specialization, but also this whole focus or shift of focus on the number of followers and subscribers you have. And, and I think this is really true that, you know, we have to look at the quality. I mean, it's kind of basic, right? The quality of our contacts. But I think we too often we get sucked into this whole thing about look how big, how many connections I have. I think that's passe thinking. And so I love the fact that you highlighted that. So thank you for that. But so, so Jimmy, you're talking about sales for life. But I also know you mentioned that you got a new project coming on board here because you really... You really want to go to the next, next level, whatever that may be. And so tell us about this new project you're working on. So for eight years, uh, Sales for Life has been certifying sellers on social selling and account-based sales development, right? There's two programs, digital or social selling mastery is think of an inbound sales motion and then one called spear selling, which is bound account-based sales development motion. To become certified in our program, every seller has a 90-day window where they actually have to select plan, engage, and uh, an account, and create a real live opportunity, and then film how they created that opportunity, and then defend it in a business case to their manager. So over the years, we've certified a quarter million sellers. That sounds great. But here's what naturally happens is Pareto's law kicks in. And so you train a quarter million sellers, and you reach, you know, you're constantly in contact with them months or years later, and you recognize that there's this pervasive problem that has re- remained is that a seller knows inherently that 11% on average of their week of time spent needs to be unfortunately spent on research. It's that part of the left brain, that medical rote side that nobody wants to trigger where they need to gather intelligence about their key accounts. What's happening? Are competitors going into that account? Are there new job changes? Are there relationship roadmaps? We've been teaching this at nauseum, but Pareto's law kicked in and people just don't want to do it. So pre-COVID, like you, Victor, I was on 80 flights a year for five years in a row. So I didn't have time to think of this idea of, can I own a second company? Can we do other things? COVID happened, took me off a plane. And I turned to my business partner and I said, um, I want to tackle this idea, building a managed services firm or a business process as a service firm in which we will monitor signal intelligence 
at a global scale, like a global command center on behalf of our customers and actually deliver the intelligence directly to the seller so they can almost gain back that 11% a week. Um, and so that's what we've built. And so uh, it started with an alpha in 2020, alpha, then a beta. Then we went live with our existing Sales for Life customers. And now this new company, Pipeline Signals, launches at the end of July. And it is a full services firm that takes on any customer, uh, any group of customers, prospects, or white space that you want to monitor in the whole world. And we deliver that intelligence directly to the sellers, uh, directly in any sales tool you need so that you can buy back your time and action right away. Love it. So Pipeline, pipeline Signals, and the website's going to be PipelineSignals.com. PipelineSignals yeah. Love it. So, so let me give you the hypothetical so I can make sure that I understand it and the people listening understand it. I have, I don't know, a, a small, medium-sized business, right? Medium-sized business, right? I got about 100 salespeople. I sell a fantastic widget. Uh, it's somewhat competitive market, not hyper-competitive. It's a... Uh, Somewhere between red and blue, somewhere I guess, somewhere in there. How would I use you? How would how would how can you help me with my hundred sales guys? Um, by the way, I'm using a platform. I I got a CRM platform like a Salesforce. Yeah. Uh, I'm using maybe some conversational intelligence like Gong.io. Yeah, and you use buying intent yeah. data from I don't know demand base from Bora or Six Sense. There you go. Exactly. You got, you got it. So uh, all all fantastic. So think of it as complement, not not an and or. And so as a seller, each one of those hundred sellers has their version of a total addressable market. For some, that is a geographic territory. For some, that's an entire vertical or a continent or a country or a state that they're going after. Um, and some is a set of named accounts. Some could be perspective, some named. But each of them have an individual total addressable market. What we do is we, uh, when we onboard with our customers, we map who sells to what? Simplest way to think about it. And by understanding who sells to what, then we know what accounts are important to you. What is your ideal customer profile? So the type of people within, you know, key stakeholders, change influencers within an account you sell to. And, um, and then we apply these 14 different sales plays or signals against those accounts. Examples. Did anybody leave one of your happy customers in London, England last month up and left and joined a company, but that company's headquartered in San Francisco. So your rep in EMEA would never have told your rep in Americas that this had happened. Another example. Um, they, uh, they just hired a new chief operating officer at one of the accounts that have been stalled out. Where did they come from? How are they connected to your customers? All this. In so, now at a global level, so whether you have a thousand customers, ten thousand customers, we're cross-referencing this with analysts to bring this data back to the sales community, and then the sellers choose the mediums in which they're uh, digesting that intelligence. For some, that's in Salesforce. For some, it's in Outreach or Sales Loft, and in some, it's in CSV files because. That's just the way they like it. So, um, and all it is, it's intelligence that they inherently knew they were supposed to mine. But I'm a big, big believer. There's $5 an hour tasks and there's $500 an hour value creators. And your sellers, you need them making, doing the $500 an hour value creators. We're just pulling the $5 an hour task right out of their hands. Gotcha. And and so, yeah, I love that, by the way. I, I, I love the way you laid that out. So I'm, I'm excited for you, Jamie. I'm really I, excited I, for you. I'm telling you, I'm, it's going to be bigger than sales for life. <laughs> okay, okay. It's it, it's exciting because I, I, I started to visualize how I would use this as a salesperson, right? I'd get all those, I guess, almost like connections, second, third order connections, and then try to draw some conclusions. And then me as a salesperson, I would then have to figure out, my go-to-market strategy based on this new intelligence. Yeah, so you're now getting, um, think of it, whether it's in a, if it was in, a, if people think of an Excel, I'm giving you name, uh, LinkedIn profile, job title, what had happened to them. So what is the compelling event? Was it that they came from a customer and now they're in a prospect? Are they connected to a competitor? Did they just, you know, get hired? Whatever it is. And that intelligence is then you choose which tool do you want that to be shined into? And that could be Salesforce as an example. 
I love it. The I don't know. If, I don't know if you know, but I wrote a book on artificial intelligence and sales. Yeah, right? well, I listened to your podcast <clears throat> on it. Thank you. So, and, and what I love about what you're presenting, it is kind of a different angle, and it complements some of the stuff that's out there. And so, so I'm forecasting that Jamie's company will be bought in five years. And I'm forecasting. Pina coladas. <laughs> he's sipping pina coladas on the beach somewhere. And once in a while, he say, "Hey, Victor, he calls me up. How you doing, man?" I said, "I'm still in the grind." So I'm excited for you, man. So. Uh, on, on the technical side, you said you mentioned like 14 signals, I think you said. But I, I, I can only imagine that as your database grows, by database, I mean your intelligence platform grows, you'll be able to kind of really expand on, you know, all these signals. And so talk to me about that. that I, I guess talk to me about signals in general and signals intelligence. Yeah. So this as a category has become explosive. So but you need to almost break out signals into subcategories. So you've got an entire ecosystem called buying intent signals. And that market is so heavily capitalized. And Zoom Info is leading a huge charge against Aberdeen, Sixth Sense, Bombora, Demand Base, all these companies. And what they're doing, just for any listener who might not have this in their in their sales operations or marketing operations, Imagine knowing who's Googling the keyword artificial intelligence for right now. Imagine knowing who's on Victor's website and what they're looking at. And we're not talking basic Google analytics. Like it starts scoring and creating an algorithm as to, well, what is this pattern of buying intent behavior? That entire category is using robotic process automation, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Okay, so that's not us. <laughs> that's a whole category, billion, a multi-billion dollar market cap. There's another one that sits um, adjacent to it. We call it product usage. Our customer Microsoft calls it workload consumption. So imagine you're on the customer success side and somebody's using your actual software. Well, wouldn't you want to know who's using it more, less, last month? Uh, would you want to know who's using it the right way, the wrong way? So Microsoft is a huge advocate of product usage data. They can monitor everyone using Azure around the world. Who stopped using it? Who's, who's doing more project cycles this month? Who's doing less project cycles? Who's using it incorrectly? And so these are all data points that give to their CSM to say, you've got a churn risk here, or you've got a real upsell opportunity here. Again, not us. But there's... Other tech companies that we've encountered that are diving into that product usage category. And a, a real life free example of that is you can check out a website called builtwith.com. So any software in the world that is tied to a website can be tracked. So you go to builtwith.com and look up Victor's website and it will show you what CRM he uses, what marketing automation he uses. Does he use Crazy Egg or whatever software tool it's on there? Those two categories we don't touch. Then you've got this other category called compelling events. And Victor, to your point, we teach right now we're mining signals that are based on the curriculum that we've been training for the last eight years. But that library can expand. So examples of the sales place, I can tell you who's going into a company, promoted in a company, leaves a company. I can tell you if an IT department doubles or shrank in half. I can tell you if they're recruiting right now for certain roles with certain keywords, competitive keywords, product keywords. I can tell you as an example, if that person left from a customer and went to a prospect or went to another customer, all of that intelligence as an example sits inside LinkedIn. And as a managed services firm, we are a person. We are a, an SDR with inside our customer because we're a pro serve. And eventually, other technology tools will accompany that LinkedIn data to make up a very a great, well-rounded, compelling event. You know, who's going IPA, uh, IPO? Who's doing a merger and acquisition right now? Who, you know, who just wrote an article on their LinkedIn and congratulating their own company about their Series B at scale? I can tell you that everywhere in the United States right now. And so that intelligence, if you sold into companies that are raising, there's a whole list for you right there. And so that, 
it's it's mined as a professional services firm. That I, it's mind blowing. I mean, because you're beyond. It's you. I want people to understand. We're not talking just trigger events, right? We're also trying to predict based on all these signals what their intent is, or what might happen or might not happen. But for the salesperson to have this type of data and then align it with what they're trying to do, it's amazing. Well, as a salesperson, so it's really important to understand that people buy from people, right? And so people are the ultimate leading indicator to priorities going in a business or leaving a business. And so when you track human capital migration, that singular change is a, is a, an indicator enough to realize that when that CXO joins a company, he or she wants to shake things up. When the person you've been calling leaves, the whole priority and that whole project you were working on just left the door. And so human capital migration is something that, and again, yeah, you can. Ex- I love, by the way, I love that yeah, phrase. Hey, I've never heard that well, phrase. You can, <laughs> you can expand the data sets uh, right. uh, all, uh, all, uh, all mm-hmm. companies want, but I always encourage companies, imagine just doing the basics really, really well. Mm. Um, and that's kind of where this came from. Man, it, it's it's trying to. It's funny because what you're trying to do is corral movement and intention. You know, when you th- when you look at the data and then try to figure out how does that apply to what we're selling when we're using that data, man. So I'm excited for you, Jamie. I think like what brought on this one. I mean, you kind of mentioned it already, but what really solidified like, hey, this is the direction to go. This is what I want to do. This is the next level for me. Uh, it really uh, so um, the big thing is there's a different type of breed of people that start a professional services firm. Because you all watch Instagram and you watch Saster and all these things and you see all these software companies raising oodles and oodles of money and you realize as a pro serve, you're not on that same trajectory. You're in a great cash flow business, but you're not in that, you know, uh, Mark Zuckerberg future kind of level. So you have to be comfortable in your own skin that why did you start a professional services firm? And it's ultimately, you have to really love helping people. Otherwise, you just can't be in pro serve. It comes back to why did I start training and why would I do anything in pro serve? And I love pro serve because I really do honestly want to help people. And so I would see our support tickets in, in sales for life from training. And it was constant. Like, can you just do this for me? Like we were teaching people to visualize their total addressable market and then mine signals within their TAM. They might only have 20 accounts or 100 accounts and they would groan and moan and oh my god this is so hard (laughs) i thought like oh my god imagine being the chief revenue officer and you knew that your 900 sellers right now hate monitoring their 20 accounts each that that only takes 15 minutes a week to do but the missed opportunity if i was the cro and my compensation and my stock plan is all tied to all this I honestly just started feeling sorry for these guys and gals. And mm-hmm. so um, it's just out of a labor of love of helping people. Like, I, I, for eight years, I've been watching this. I, I can't watch this anymore. I got to step in. And... <laughs> I got I to I step in. Yeah, I, can't I can't watch do this horror movie anymore. <laughs> By the way, are you, are you going to like, because uh, if you write a book around this, I'm reading it. So have you thought about, you know, yeah, maybe. So we've got a document couple. what this is going to be. I, you know, you and I were talking about this before the call. I've got these books like half written or three quarters written Mm. and one of them will be on um compelling event signal intelligence right so uh, there's Mm. a whole world going to teach you buying intent that's not us it's going to be on compelling events and uh, Mm. we really want to um category control uh, pioneer this Mm -hmm. idea of um being able to mine this intelligence for people well, I, I love it. I love the name of the company, Pipeline Signals. I think that's your title of the book, man. If I could, if I may be so bold as to suggest something. Oh, thank you. Because I, it, it's very indicative, right? You got signals in your pipeline. We got to understand what these uh, signals my are. My business so partner and Amar and I struggled picking him like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> yeah, I love that. It's, by the way, it's simple. It's self descriptive. You know what I mean? There's not a lot of explaining that has to go on once you kind of go, oh, Pipeline Signals, signals in your pipeline. <laughs> exactly. I get it. Boom. <laughs> It's a two-page book, man. Yeah, exactly. The title, the book, like, but I look forward. Jamie, where can they find out more information about you, uh, what you're doing now for Sales for Life, and also Pipeline So signals? connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I should be easy to find. I think my LinkedIn, it's Jamie Shanks, or it's Jamie T. Shanks. 
you'll see this kind of face on LinkedIn. Um, sales for Life, it is truly as it is, salesforlife.com. That is a teach you how to business. And then Pipeline Signals, by the end of July, we'll have a website and it'll all be live. And that is pipelinesignals.com. Love it, man. Anyway, on that note, thank you, Jamie. This is Victor Antonio. Check out the website again, Pipeline Pipeline Signals and Sales for Life, Jamie Shanks. I'll put the your information in the show notes as well. And that is it for the Sales Influence Podcast. Leave me some feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, YouTube, Pandora, Spotify, wherever you're listening or watching this. Uh, again, check out the Sales Velocity Academy if you haven't checked that out. Also, check out Jamie's information. And this is Victor Antonio signing off, always reminding you, sell it ain't hard when you have the right signals and you know how. Take care. Thank you.